Please turn your Bibles to James chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 9, 10 and 11. James chapter 1 verse 9. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes without his business. This is the word of God. Two verses, short sermon. This is just where the text naturally divides in James, so it's difficult do anything more than those two verses, three verses, otherwise you end up in a kind of different theme. So that's why we're fo- focusing on, on these three verses. Um, and we may well be a little bit shorter this evening. Let's pray. Our Father, we humble ourselves before you this evening because you are a great God And in view of who you are and who we are, we fade into insignificance. We are nothing. We are but dust who has had life breathed into it. You are eternal. You have always been. And we know that it is because of your eternality that you have so graciously offered to us eternal life in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this incredible gift of eternal life that you give to us when we trust and believe in him. And we thank you that we can know with certainty that whatever we have in this world, whatever we are in this world, what is far more important is what we are going to and what we will be one day in the eternal realm. So help us to fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us not to be distracted from him. And this evening, may he shine above all else. For his sake we pray. Amen. I don't know if it was a trend in Australia. Some of you who are older may be able to clue me in here. But in the 1980s and sort of towards the mid, mid-80s to mid-90s, it was quite popular to put bumper stickers on your car. And there were all kinds of bumper stickers. I grew up in a coastal city, Durban in South Africa, and we used to get the people from Johannesburg come and pollute our beaches every, every summer. And there was a sticker that, on the bumpers that was popular that said, Welcome to Durban, now go home. There was another sticker that um, was really, I remember riding behind and seeing on a number of different cars, normally nicer cars than others, that read like this. It said, the man or the person with the most toys wins. And I remember thinking about that and thinking to myself, well, what do you win? Maybe you win a nice home. Maybe you win being able to spend money and go on a holiday. Maybe you've got everything that opens and shuts. Maybe you've got money to spend lavishly on extravagant clothes or possessions. But what do you have in the eternal realm? What do you have when you die? What then are you taking with you? And as someone once said, when we die... We take nothing with us. It all remains behind. And what James wants to bring to our attention this evening 
is this contrast between rich and poor, and he wants us to remind us that the poor Christian, the humble Christian, the one who doesn't have a lot, is able to boast. But in what sense can that humble Christian boast? What are they able to boast in? Because in the main, in Scripture, as we will see, boasting is forbidden. And yet James wants to draw our attention to the advantage that the humble Christian enjoys in this world, apart, opposed to those who are well-known, who have prominence in this world, who are recognized when they walk on the street because of their celebrity status, and who have all the wealth that anyone could ever imagine. And James wants to remind us that for all of that stuff they may have, at the end of the day, none of it brings any certainty to life. Zero. And so he wants to encourage the ordinary Christian, you and me, the ordinary Christian, and wants to say to them, you have so much to boast in. And what we boast in, of course, is not our status in the world, but our status in Christ. Because Christ elevates us to another level. And Christ gives us dignity that we would not have were we not in him. And so he wants to remind us that true wealth is bound up in a relationship with Jesus And those who are poor in the eyes of the world should not think somehow they have lost out on what is really valued in the eternal realm. So we're going to do this in reverse order. The first thing I want you to notice that comes out in verses 10 and 11 is the false value of wealth. Look at verses 10 and 11. And we'll come back to verse 9. For the sun rises with scorching heat, and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, oh, sorry, I left out verse 10, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. If we can pass, just stop there for a moment. Notice how he frames it. The one who is rich should take pride in his low position. The first thing we need to grapple with in this text is, who is he referring to? Is he referring to the rich unbeliever who's out there, who has lots of money, or is he referring to the wealthy believer in the Christian community who has a lot? Now, it's not always easy to come to a definite conclusion But it seems from verse 9, when he says, in verse 9, the brother, that even though he doesn't say the brother in verse 10, there is a continuation of the same theme. So it looks as though he's dealing with Christians here, because the grammar seems to indicate that, as does the context, as does the flow of the thought coming in this passage. So what James is doing now is he's going into a community of Christians that were quite poor, and he's contrasting amongst them some wealthy people. Now, there weren't a lot of wealthy people in their midst, but there were a few of them who had lots of money. And so he's speaking about them and how they need to measure their wealth, how they need to think in terms of their wealth. Now, I know that as you and I sit here this evening— you may be thinking, hang on, I don't slip into that category. When you and I think of wealthy, who's the kind of people that come to mind? It's the people who live on the North Shore, isn't it? It's the people who have boats and nice luxury cars and whose homes are worth $10, $15 million and who have high-paying jobs and have their own little bay, those are the kinds of people we think of as wealthy, or as celebrities who have made millions through movies. And yet that's not what James is necessarily thinking of, though they would fit into that category. But when we think in terms of wealth in our own society, if we were to contrast that with a country like Ethiopia or Nigeria, 
or Bolivia, or Pakistan, or Indonesia, and we were to start thinking in terms of what they would consider to be wealthy, then we fit into the wealthy in terms of how they would think. Because in terms of the kind of things that we get to enjoy, many of them will never enjoy. Some of them struggle just to put food on the table. Some of them don't even get three meals a day. And you only need to go to some of those countries to see the kind of poverty that is prevalent there to realize that we live in a wealthy country. In fact, if you look at it statistically, Australia fits into the top 3 to 5% of the world in terms of its wealth. So in terms of being wealthy, it is all relative, isn't it? In fact, wealth is not only relative in terms of those outside there in the poorer parts of the world, but it's even relative in terms of the way in which we think personally about our wealth. Because what I may consider to be something that I can enjoy, perhaps someone who has immigrated from another country into Australia and is finding their way and battling to find work, they wouldn't have the same level of wealth that I have. So even within our society, there would be gradings depending on where you fit. Now, we live in Castle Hill and the surrounding suburbs in a relatively wealthy suburb. When I went to a council meeting, for example, I was told that they are the second richest council in the country. Now, I don't know if that's still true. That was a couple of years ago. The shopping center over here, Castle Hill, I think is the second or third highest turnover in the country. So we are fundamentally in a rich suburb. Even though you may think, well, how come I don't have all those riches that you're talking about? And James is saying, trying to remind people who are in that situation that for all the wealth you enjoy and have, at the end of the day, it's transitory. It can change in the blink of an eye. And whatever wealth you may enjoy, it can have no impact upon the longevity of your life. Oh, yes, I know that you might be able to afford, or wealthy people may be able to afford, certain medical treatments because they can afford the money to pay for them. But at the end of the day, James wants to remind us of some simple things. And he says, not even the most wealth can prevent you from dying. And he does that by way of illustration. He makes three basic points. 10b. First, they fade away. Like a, uh, because he will pass away like a wild flower. And the point that he's making there is that in spite of the health you and I might enjoy today, that health can change tomorrow. None of us is guaranteed a healthy life in this world. Now, I've been a pastor long enough to see this unfold in front of my eyes. I've seen people who haven't had a day's worth of sickness suddenly get diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer is a death sentence. No one they have known has survived longer than five to seven years of pancreatic cancer. And that can change in the blink of an eye. And 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16, Paul brings up the same point. He says, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. Yet, inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Our bodies are slowly but surely decaying. This was brought home to me recently when I hadn't played squash for about four or five months. And I went to the squash court and played a game of squash. The next three or four days, I was walking in pain because my muscles were sore on my legs everywhere. And it was hard to stand up, to sit down. It was hard just to bend over and lift up my legs and put a clothes on because my muscles were so painful. And I remember thinking to myself, when I was 16 years old, playing in a rugby match at school, the next team above me, the under-17s, were shorter playing. They asked me if I would play straight after my game had finished, and I did. 
and it was a breeze. I just couldn't do that today because the body just isn't the same. Now, I know some of you younger ones sitting here thinking, yeah, that's, just, that, that, that's a long time away. Just you wait. It comes quicker than you think. And for all the decaying of the body, wealth cannot prevent the slow deterioration of the body. Yes, you can go for a fla- facelift. Yes, you can go for those injections in your lips. And when you see some of the way those lips get so big, you just think whatever you do, don't put your head out the window when you're in a car. Your lips will beat you to death. But you can see some of the cosmic surgery people go through in order to try and retain their youth. But at the end of the day, no one can stop it. You get old, the gray hair comes. The wrinkles come. The sagging skin comes. The sore muscles, the sore back. You pay for the injuries you pick up now in your young, while you're young and in your youth. And James is saying, Wealth can't stop that. Second, death can be unexpected. Look at verse 11. Death can be unexpected. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers, and the plant its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade even while he goes about his business. Death is unexpected. That even while he is going about his business, and James, when he talks about that, is talking about he's away on a business trip somewhere, and death unexpectedly taps him on the shoulder, and he dies while he's away doing his business. No one knows when terminal disease might strike. No one knows when you may be involved in a car accident. No one knows when you might go to put your head down on the pillow in the evening and the next morning you don't wake up because your heart has stopped. Now, we've experienced that in this church. For those of you who remember, Emily Apostolos was 17 years old and the following day was her 18th birthday. And she put her head down on her pillow that night and never woke up that morning. Because her heart failed. Death has no favorites. Death has no age that it sets. It can happen at any time. Now, I'm not here to depress you. But I'm here to try and confront you with the reality of the frailty of life. And the only way that you and I can have any confidence in our lives in this world is to know with certainty that we are in Christ and know that we have been given eternal life by Christ, for we have trusted in Him and we have received it as a gift upon our repentance and faith. Who can forget just about a year ago the death of Shane Warne? He was a man who had, according to the newspaper, about 52 million worth of wealth went overseas on a detox diet and had a massive heart attack. Death comes suddenly, unexpectedly, and the question you need to ask is, are you prepared to face it? And don't think just because you're 15 or 16 or 17 that you guaranteed long life. You never know, and God forbid, and I mean this with all my heart, that God should take any of you young people while you're young. I pray and hope that God will give you long life, but I'm not naive enough to know that not everyone gets the gift of long life. And so while you are in this world, make your life count. Don't let it fritter away. Don't let it waste away. Don't allow the years to pass without having built up the only treasure that will last, and that is eternal treasure. Don't get so caught up in worldly things that you lose sight of eternal things. Because at the end, those are the only things that are going to matter. Not what you've accomplished in this world secularly. Third, the wind is inevitable. 
it will come. This talks about the scorching heat, which is brought on by the strong Sirocco winds that would come and cause these flowers under the sun to wither and fade. And this hot wind that would blow would bring about swift destruction. It was inevitable that it would come. And James likewise is reminding us that death is inevitable. It is still, as far as I am aware, one per person. You're not going to escape. No one's going to escape. It's coming. It's only a matter of time. We are told in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, very sobering verses, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Death comes, and then we are transported into the eternal realm where we will face God. Notice it says while he's on business, he dies. The trial here is death. And thus, wealth is falsely valued when measured according to earthly standards because it has no benefit after death, and it can't stop you from dying, and it can't prevent or prolong your years. Every second of your life has been determined in advance by God. It is God who gives life. It is God who takes away. And you have an appointment. God has an appointment for you. And you are not going to lengthen that by one second, no matter what you do. Psalm chapter 49, verses 16 to 17 says, Do not be overawed when a man grows rich, when the splendor of his house increases, for he will take nothing with him when he dies. His splendor will not descend with him. Luke 12, 15, Jesus focuses on a similar theme. Then he said to them, Watch out! Be in your guards against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? There's a story told of Rose Greenhow during the American Civil War who was a spy. She tried to evade capture and the loss of her fortune by sewing gold she had gained into the seams of her dress. The ship she boarded unfortunately sank, and the weight of the gold made it impossible for the life preserver to support her. She sank to the bottom with all her wealth. You can have all the riches in the world. But do you have eternal wealth? Are you storing up eternal treasure? Is your life secure in Christ? Because that's the only security you can have in this world that transcends the uncertainty of what happens in this world. Life is incredibly uncertain. Are you prepared to meet your maker? And then secondly, I want you to notice the true value of wealth. Verse 9. The brother in humble circumstances should take pride, ought to take pride in his high position. Now that's really, really interesting. In complete contrast, now the poor man here that James is speaking about is the poor Jewish Christian. So what happened is the Jews were scattered out of Jerusalem, chased out to uh, northern Palestine and Syria. And there they settled outside of their land, and they took nothing with them because the escape was so fast out of Jerusalem that they couldn't take anything with them. And so as a result of that, they were settled in northern Palestine and Syria and were very, very poor people who didn't have a lot in this world. Yet in spite of that, notice what he says. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride In fact, that word can be translated boast, or to boast 
in his high position. But isn't boasting wrong? Should we not boast about anything? And what's this high position that he's boasting in? Well, boasting in Scripture is mainly seen in a negative sense. I've just pulled out a few. James 4.16, a little later, he says, As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. But he's saying here you can boast. Hang on. Galatians 6.13. Not even those who are circumcised obey the Lord, yet they want you to be circumcised so that they may boast about your flesh. Also negative. Or Ephesians 2 verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, not by works, lest any man boast. So there is certainly, in most of Scripture, when it speaks about boasting or pride, it always speaks about it in a negative um, way. So what makes it positive in this context? Well, notice what he says, that the boasting, it glories, it boasts in its exalted position, and the exalted position it's boasting in is the exalted position it has in Christ. What does he mean by that? Well, what he means is that when we come to faith in Christ, the ground is level. There is no hierarchy in terms of people who are valued more or valued less because of their status in this world. In other words, what James is saying is that our value is bound up not in what we are or in who we are as people in this world or what we possess, but our value is bound up in the image of Christ that is in us. We have been bought with the blood of Christ. We have been rescued from our sin. We have been uh, drawn into a relationship with Jesus. And as a result of that, we have obtained a new status. In other words, our self-worth is in Christ. You have value that is associated with who you are as a child of Christ because the value which has been placed on you is the value of the sacrifice of the death of Jesus Christ. He has died in order that you might be saved. He has sacrificed his life for you. And his life is of immense value. And therefore, that's the value you have in Christ. You have been exalted into the heavenlies. You have been seated with Christ. And thus, your life takes on new value. And so, James says, we boast in glorying in our position in Christ. Such boasting is the only boasting acceptable to God. And we see this coming out elsewhere in Scripture. Romans chapter 5, verse 11, for example. Not only this, but we also boast or rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Or 1 Corinthians 1 31. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Or 2 Corinthians 10, 17, almost repeated, verbatim. But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Or Philippians 3, 3. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship the Spirit of God, who glory or who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, whenever pride or boasting is spoken about in a positive sense in Scripture, it is always spoken about with reference to Christ. We boast in Him. We boast because of Him. We boast in the new status we have in Him. He has taken us and He has elevated us to be seated at His right hand. It is Jesus who gives us value. It's not a self-focused, a self-centered boasting, but their position before God. And thus, our life is given new dignity, new worth, new value. 
because its value now is not bound up on whether it's recognized as prominent in this world, whether it has status or lack of status in this world. It has status because it's in Christ. And the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's no hierarchy there. Jesus removes the distinctions. Galatians 3.28, there's no Jew nor Gentile, male or female, slave or free man. Because when we come to faith in Christ, we come all as sinners. And we stand before Christ in the same way, on the same ground, and receive the same forgiveness. Jesus accepts all who come to him in faith and repentance. Aren't you glad that even though you may never ever achieve fame in this world and never be recognized on the street, that's not a bad thing because of any celebrity status that you don't have, that you are valuable because Christ has died and placed value on you through his own life. That's why you see, it, we should never talk about self-image as a Christian. If self-image, if we focus on our self-image, that, and that self-image is conditioned upon what others think of us or what the world thinks of us, then it won't take long before you become depressed. It won't take long before you start beating yourself up because you may not be recognized by others in the way that you would like to be recognized. But if our self-image is bound up with Jesus and our worth and our values in Christ, then you are valuable, period, because of Jesus. We won't go through that depressing dance with feeling valuable and then not valuable and valuable and then not valuable depending on the opinions of others. There's only one opinion in this world that matters and that's Christ. And he has made a declaration about you if you know him. And he has said, you are mine. I died for you. I paid the penalty for your sin. And his life is of the most utmost value and therefore so is yours. And thus, James says to these believers, don't worry about being poor in the eyes of the world. Don't worry about being despised in the eyes of the world. Don't worry about being marginalized in the eyes of the world. Don't worry about being ignored in the eyes of the world. Don't worry about not having any fame in the eyes of the world. Don't worry about being unimportant in the eyes of the world. Because you are important because of Jesus. And thus true wealth is not measured in what I accumulate here, but it is measured by a completely different value, set of values. And the set of values by which our, our wealth is measured, Jesus speaks about in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19 and 20, where he makes this proclamation. Let me read them to you. Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures for yourself in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. That's where our true tre treasure is. It's in heaven. And so we build up our treasure in heaven by not being worrying about whether we have lots of money or little money in this world, by serving Christ, by engaging in dedicating our lives to Christ. And allowing him to be the one that, predom that dominates our lives so that we, we revolve everything we do around Jesus. And as you serve him, as many of you older people have so faithfully over so many years, you are accumulating treasure in heaven. As a wealthy person said to a poor Christian, when I leave this world, I leave it all behind. When you leave this world, you go to your treasure in heaven. Isn't that true? There's a story, and I'm going to end with this. There's a story told of, uh, by Sigmund Fried of a shipwrecked sailor on one of the South Sea Islands he was seized by the natives, hoisted to their shoulders, carried to the village, 
and sat on a royal throne. Little by little, he learned that it was their custom once each year to make some man a king for one year. He liked it until he began to wonder what happened to all the former kings. Soon he discovered that every year when, his kingship, when their kingship was ended, the king was banished to an island where he starved to death. The sailor did not like that, but was smart enough, and while he was king for a year, so he put his carpenters to work making boats. His farmers to work transplanting fruit and trees to the island, farmers growing crops, masons building houses, so that when his kingship was over, he was banished not to a barren island, but to an island of abundance. One day, when you depart from this world, you are either going to go to a world where there will be abundance, or you're going to go to a world where there will be darkness and gnashing of teeth. Either you will go to your heavenly treasure that you've been accumulating through your faithfulness to Christ, through serving Him throughout your life, how many years He gives you, to a rich treasure prepared for you, and you will enjoy for all eternity, or you will go to nothing. And the choice ultimately becomes ours. And James says it's not a matter of whether or not you have made it in this world, but whether or not you make it into the next world. So don't focus on what you don't have in this world. Remember what you are accumulating in the next world and allow your energy to be directed towards that. It's not about spending all our time and effort in accumulating wealth by working long hours that draw away our time from serving Christ. But it's about trying to work around our work situation so that we can give as much time to Christ as possible in serving Him in the here and the now. So that our eternal treasure is building up in heaven. And then whether you die at age 25 or whether you die at age 85, it won't make much difference if you've been serving Christ faithfully and wholeheartedly and devotedly. Because you will go to a rich reward. In, prepared for you by Christ in heaven. And so James is reminding his readers here and reminding us today that wealth in the eternal realm counts for nothing. But a life spent to the glory of God in faithful service is a life well lived. That I remember seeing on the door of a friend of mine's house I grew up with. Um, we were best of mates as a youngsters. He's in New Zealand and Auckland now. We've had a friendship of about 56 years. Seeing on that toilet door, tis one short life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So can I encourage you, especially you young people, you don't know what you've got ahead of you. You might have another 60, 70 years ahead of you, 80 years ahead of you, some of you. You might only have 10 years ahead of you. You might only have five years ahead of you. But wherever you are in life, whether you're young, middle age, or more mature, doesn't matter where you are on the spectrum. If you've been serving faithfully for many years, keep going, keep going until you have no more energy left and you can sit back and know that whatever you've done, your work is done. But if you're younger, dedicate yourself now while you've got energy and time to get stuck into serving Christ because that's what's going to matter in the end, not what wealth you've built in this world. That has eternal value in serving Christ. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word that reminds us of where our true value should be, where our true boasting should be. May you help us, Lord Jesus, not to allow ourselves to become so distracted by the world that all we do is accumulate in this world without making preparations for the next. Thank you for those who are sitting here this evening, you know who they are, who have over a lifetime served you so faithfully, so diligently, 
so self-sacrificially. May you continue to give them strength and energy while they remain in this world to serve you until they can't do it anymore. And for those who are younger here this evening, who look ahead to years that you may or may not grant them, for those you grant many years, and even those you perhaps may not grant many years, however many years you grant them, Lord Jesus, may they be found to be faithfully serving you with all the grace that you give them for as long as they have breath in their mouths. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand as we sing.